Okay, so my name is Brian Vasquez. I'm a software engineer at Google. And today I'll present a, a measurement study that it was conducted by Sagarika, which was an intern this summer, and with help from some co-workers. And yeah, we, I'll present uh, basically what, uh, why uh, traversing a pre CPO hash table is expensive. Uh, so the agenda for today, I'll try to uh, explain what is the motivation, uh, what's the measurement that we did, uh, what experiments were conducted, and what is our conclusion for, for this work. So let's start by the motivation. Traversing a VPO per CPU uh, is expensive. So before going to that, I want to introduce you or give you a little bit of uh, the context that we are facing. Uh, so basically at Google, we have a daemon that is running uh, on every host and it's tracking uh, every flow in the host and we use it to shape traffic. Uh, some of the information that we collect uh, is stored in a BPF per CPU hash table. And because it's tracking like every flow in the host, the table can be large as uh, 40K entries. Um, this flow stat table is dumped in user space for data processing every five seconds. So basically it's an action that we are uh, repeating uh, over and over again. So yeah, it's expensive. And another motivation for this uh, work was uh, some uh, past pitfall. Uh, so it's basically not the first time that uh, we realized that traversing a hash table is expensive. So yeah, this is the patch that <laughs> was implemented in the past, uh, which it was basically to batch uh, the operations of get next key and get element, because at that time that was where we were seeing or observing in our profiling tools. So yeah, we implemented batch ops. It was great uh, for a couple of months, I guess. Uh, it turns out it saved uh, some amount of the cycle, uh, but we didn't look in detail back then. So basically we only saved the syscall overhead, but not nothing more. Uh, so the motivation, uh, again, is uh, basically once we switch to the batch uh, functions, like basically the get, le uh, get next key and lookup element uh, disappear from our profiling tool, but we started seeing like BPF map lookup batch. And to give you an idea, uh, basically when the table is full, like uh, the processing time of, of this table, it's uh, above half a second. And again, we did this uh, every five seconds, so it's a bit expensive. So now this time, like we actually spent a little bit more time understanding uh, what was going on. So where is the cost? So our profiling uh, tool like uh, shows that the work that it was done in user space, uh, basically it was only 30%, uh, which it was just aggregating the data uh, per CPU and reporting the data. But uh, from the entire cost, 70% uh, was spent in the map lookup batch function. And surprisingly, we started seeing that uh, most than half a percent of the cost was in the PPF long main copy. So that's why we went and we tried to understand like, uh, is really PPF long main copy suboptimal? Uh, so basically we look at the code and it's not really like uh, the code is fairly simple. So why is expensive? Like the data that we were storing, uh, doesn't even require like uh, to iterate over this loop uh, many times. So it's uh, it was surprising. So why is expensive? Again, like we went uh, through all the profiling tools that we have. Uh, so it turns out that uh, from the batch operations that we are doing uh, almost the entire time is spent in cache misses uh, when reading uh, from the per CPU map value. So it's actually not copying data what is expensive, but it's that the source data that we want to copy is not there. So if you can look here, like uh, it's a little bit small, but uh, basically 87% of the cost is spent in cache misses in this function. Uh, so again, like uh, we wanted to get more detail of uh, how much or to, to get an idea of uh, how expensive was this. So we use a uh, stat, which is a great tool that was developed by Luigi. Uh, so this tool basically allows to uh, annotate certain parts of the code and to 
record like uh, the time that it takes to do the main uh, BPF long copy. And basically we record that into this uh, tool that we report a histogram of uh, how much is taking uh, to iterate every single entry. Uh, so I'm showing here like the code that is needed to, uh, to get the stats. So it's pretty simple. And there are like two versions of the, how we recorded the stats because basically case stats has a little bit of overhead. So we were concerned uh, about uh, maybe this uh, getting us numbers uh, that uh, were affected by the measurement tool. Uh, so yeah, in one of them, like uh, the annotation is inside. Uh, so trying to, uh, so basically we are using a uh, case stats a little bit more and the previous one, uh, the annotation is outside and then we divide by the number of elements that we traverse. Uh, so the results that we got uh, on the left side is the, the first method that I show. Uh, so yeah, basically I'm showing here like uh, two different platforms. Uh, one of them is uh, IMD ROM, which is the Sentu uh, chip. Uh, this platform has a uh, 256 core, which is a lot. That's also like why we picked this platform to show that the per CPU uh, data structure is a little bit costly. And we also show an Intel uh, Skylake with 100 uh, cores. So if we look at the percentiles, uh, we can see that uh, basically on the AMD platform, like uh, each entry, like just to copy the, just to, to put the data in the buffer, like it takes uh, about uh, 15 microseconds, uh, but the tail is 25 microseconds. And apparently the Intel Skylake platform is already like uh, good enough. Like uh, we can see that the 50 percentile is just a, uh, about a uh, five micros, uh, microseconds, uh, but tail can be large. But uh, also like it's important to know that uh, the distribution is pretty flat. So basically mean and average are going to be really close. And the next table is basically the same experiment where we measure uh, the cycles uh, where we measure basically instead of the internal instrumentation, we put the instrumentation out, out of the loop. So we can see that actually like uh, the, the, the tail got lower. Uh, but that, at the, it still gives you an idea of uh, how much it costs to traverse an entry, uh, which uh, it's quite expensive, especially if you have a large table. Uh, so basically we conducted some results uh, but before conducting results, I want to uh, maybe explain a little bit how this data structure uh, is laid out. So we understand why uh, it was really hard like to, to find a way to iterate it and maybe do some trick or try to exploit some uh, data locality. So basically this uh, hash table is implemented like regular hash tables. Like we have a, a list of buckets. Uh, each bucket will be a linked list. Uh, but also we have the elements. The elements are allocated uh, separately. So we have a, some pre-allocation going on. Uh, but when we have a per CPU data structure, it's important to know that uh, we allocate the structure. Uh, we reserve the space for the key, but the value is not there. Actually, the value is a pointer that will point to a per CPU uh, data, which uh, ends up being uh, an array. And Basically, with the offset of the CPU, you will have a pointer that is accessing a different uh, memory area. So basically, the value, like when it's per CPU, this data won't be contiguous. And, and also because uh, when we are adding entries to the buckets in the hash table, like uh, this data also won't be contiguous. So it could be that this entry is in this bucket, but this entry will be in this bucket. So Basically, the memory is so sparse that it's really hard like to find a different strategy to iterate over the data structure. So basically, the only option that we had or that it was a good in terms of trade-off, it was a prefetch to the rescue. So yeah, like we know that it was some cache misses. So the only thing that we did is a, to try to prefetch the per CPU data in advance. And we experimented with different values because also it seems that uh, if we look at the 
batch function, like there's not much work to do. It, it's only copying the data and then it's done. And this operation is super fast. So to really exploit prefetch here, like we needed to uh, prefetch so uh, different entries in advance. Like we cannot prefetch the one that we are going to copy. Uh, so basically that was part of the experiment that we did. Uh, so yeah, here we have the results uh, where uh, at least on AMD, it seems that prefetch intent uh, entries in advance uh, reduces the average uh, of a single entry uh, when the table is full. And I, I said at least 50%, but it's actually a lot. Like, uh, unfortunately, the numbers are a little bit uh, unreadable. But basically, I, uh, before I said that the average was about a uh, 15, uh, no, yeah, 15 microseconds. So when we are at a prefetch uh, 10 entries in advance on the AMD platform, we can basically got almost to a uh, five microseconds or uh, 5,000 nanoseconds. So we did this experiment and we also tried it uh, to basically see like uh, how it would be with when the table is not uh, super full. So here, the blue line, we experimented with uh, 2,500 entries. And we also play with prefetch. Uh, but on AMD, it seems that uh, prefetching, it does help. Uh, I guess that it's architecture dependent. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Intel Skylake uh, didn't show like good results on prefetching. Like actually it was adding cost, which means that maybe uh, on Intel, because uh, this platform has less cores, and also the memory uh, hierarchy is a little bit different in the in the hardware architecture, so it didn't show uh, any benefit. Uh, and and it actually at some point it does hurt. So you can see how the the perfection actually uh, makes the results way worse than they were before. Um, so the conclusion and maybe ask uh, for some uh, feedback to the community. Uh, our conclusion is that uh, traversing a per CPU data structure will become more expensive as platform grow in CPU count, which is a current trend. Uh, the current hash table implementation, uh, it's a lot of pointer chasing. Uh, the memory is, uh, it is contiguous allocation, but the way we assign these elements to the buckets, uh, basically make it non-contiguous. And also the per CPU data makes it uh, non-contiguous. So, doesn't allow us to exploit any traversal uh, or any trick at all. Uh, so alternatives, uh, we did look into alternatives. Uh, so actually we are planning to switch to BPF uh, Ether to save on aggregation. Uh, but again, like uh, from the analysis that we did, uh, it seems that copying the data is not what is expensive, but it's reading the data, the source data that we, that we want to copy. So if we look at BPF Ether, actually it suffers some cache misses as well when we are traversing per CPU elements. So I hear, uh, I put some code of the BPF Ether to basically show that basically we, we traverse the same way that the batch uh, traverse in entries and we have the same uh, mem copy and the source won't be there as well. So this will uh, be also cache misses. So yeah, like maybe we can save a uh, 20% of CPU cycles when we switch to BPF Ether, but not more. Uh, but apparently if we enable prefetch, which was a quick trick uh, on certain platforms, like we can uh, save a uh, 66% of the total cost. Um, so another alternative that we didn't have enough time to explore, uh, it's uh, maybe implement another data structure uh, yeah, we understand that per CPU data structures are good because they allow you to quickly access, the, uh, quickly modify the data. It doesn't have locks. Uh, but again, like as a CPU uh, count grows in platforms, it will be harder and harder like to aggregate the data and to access and read the source. So maybe, I don't know, like a hash table that instead of per CPU, it's per networking queue. And um, yes, this is specifically for networking uh, usage. And yeah, maybe, I don't know, like uh, I haven't looked in the code into that detail, but maybe uh, the TCP VPF front with the Q-Lock help. So maybe we don't even need to care about like uh, trying to 
coordinate uh, how uh, we write this data structure. So maybe it could be used in our favor. Um, and yeah, I guess that uh, that's uh, what I wanted to present. So any questions, comments? Questions, comments? I'll ask the obvious question if we can add the prefetch instructions to the ISA. And you can tell me why not. Uh, to the what? Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear. To the BPF ISA, right? The prefetch is, prefetch is an instruction. You can just add it and then prefetch it in your BPF iterator. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, the point. Like we already sent some patches. It was more like an RPC uh, because we were. Uh, no, no, I, I think Jacob means like. You can actually, in the BPF bytecode, you have an instruction to prefetch, right? And then the verifier expands it. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be a, a, a good idea as well. Like the, 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 the point here is that uh, maybe it makes sense, but for certain platforms, not uh, all of them. So we might need maybe a Cisco tool or, uh, or something that uh, we could uh, enable it uh, when we know that this platform will suffer because the architecture is different. The, the loop doing the for each possible CPU is a C uh, 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 helper. Yeah. So it might help in the uh, we can talk offline, I guess. Yeah, that's a good idea unless you're uh, unless somebody uh, so the, uh, another idea, idea I had uh, long time ago was to no longer use per CPU data, but per node or per level three um, setup. For example, on AMD, we can, on ROM, we have a eight level three cache like per socket. So that will be restricted to 16 value instead of 256. And that maybe that's good enough for our use case. Uh, you, that there's actually different prefetch operations. So it seems like your 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 problem is because it's on the the CPU that has multiple another memory hierarchy, but the CPUs actually support not prefetching into level one cache, but level had they have instructions for prefetching into level two and level three cache, and that seems like actually to be the problem here, right? Because you have to walk the things for all the different CPUs. So if you prefetch. You could play with prefetching to L2 or L3 and see if it there's a benefit from that, because you, you want to bring it into the to the other hierarchy. Yeah, it can also be useful if we actually go to implementing the packet classifications in BPF. So we would have to walk a list inside a classifier, and then we would definitely want to prefetch the next element, right? So we will need the expression in BPF to do it. Yeah, those, those are great ideas. Anyone else? Can you elaborate uh, on the network queue data structure that you... Uh... Uh, so it's, it's similar to what Eric was describing, but instead of using the, the cache hierarchy or the level of cache, uh, basically, it would be like instead of uh, on the AMD platform, we have a 256 cores, right? So maybe we could have a, a hash table where we can specify like uh, the the number of uh, data data points that we want or, or logs, uh, which could be tied to the networking queues, for example. Uh, so in that case, maybe in the TCP uh, in the TCBPF filter when we are uh, executing these programs, uh, because uh, and I don't know, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that we already have the Q lock in there held. So maybe also we don't need another lock uh, to implement this uh, data structure. Uh, because it, it, the, the BPF map will be updated at the Q level. Uh, so instead of uh, updating uh, 256 entries, like we will update it uh, only the queues. And for example, in these systems, we, we've seen that Usually 16 to 32 queues are uh, good enough uh, to achieve the performance that we want. So basically this data structure will become smaller. It uh, will be like 16 or, or, or 32 uh, data points instead of 256. OK, 
Okay. Yeah, that makes sense to me as well. Um, okay. Anyone else? Yeah, thank you very much.